Well, you know, we live in uh, an increasingly integrated international economy, and so uh, you have effects of capital flows, of trade for poor countries, it affects tourism, it affects uh, remittances, which uh, people are used to in the Western Hemisphere, but have been very important uh, for Africa as well. And the nature of this crisis is you need to see it coming in waves. So what might have started with uh, bad loans in the United States uh, means that you get a global slowdown which starts to hurt the economy in the developing world, and then bad loans from a bad economy in poor countries will start to hurt the banks in developing countries even though they didn't hold any U.S. mortgage debt. So in the nature of the response, you have to have a cooperative response, but it also has to recognize that you're going to have different stages of this crisis that you have to keep attacking. Well, you know, you've got a great range of developing countries, and so for some of the uh, larger developing countries that have had the ability to have their own stimulus packages, such as st China, they and India have started to become uh, poles of growth and stability in the system because they, like the United States, had a rather aggressive stabilization program. They've had monetary policies that tried to make credit available. Um, but other very large developing countries like Mexico have got hit very hard, in part because they're dependent on trade to the United States. In Mexico's case, they also had the swine flu issue. But they've also been hurt because the uh, government guaranteed debt in the developed world has made it harder for the Mexicos and the Indonesias and, and other good-sized developing countries to be able to issue their own debt. So where the United States might have a, a deficit that is over 10 percent of GDP as part of a stimulus program, the Mexicos and the Indonesias have had a challenge trying to finance 2 or 3 percent of GDP. And that's one way the World Bank can help, because we help provide some of that financing. Now then you've got some of the poorest countries, and of course the very poorest don't have much connection with the international economy, and so in some ironic fashion they're more insulated. But then you really have to look at each individual case. Um, if they're a commodity producer and prices of commodities fell, well then uh, their exports are going to go down. Um, if they were a producer of, uh, of services uh, such as tourism, some of the island economies, they obviously get hammered very hard. Um, uh, in the case of, of many countries in Central Asia, they have been dependent maybe 20, 30, 40 percent of their GDP on returns from their workers in Russia. So as Russia went down, they came down. And uh, in economy after economy, what you see are the interconnections either in a spiral down or hopefully a spiral back. Well, it's interesting that you highlight that because I think a lot of people have been unaware that about a third of the African uh, subcontinent uh, or sub-Saharan Africa is based on population has actually grown at pretty good rates over the past 10 years, and another third that had resource industries also grew well. So it's the last third that are often the post-conflict or the fragile countries struggling to hold themselves together that have really kind of held back some of the overall numbers. So in terms of the, uh, the countries in Africa, uh, again, it depends. If you're a commodity producer, uh, you've been hurt to a certain degree, tourism, remittances. In general, what I'd say is that in looking at those economies, one has to recognize that you have less cushion. So if you're in the United States or even if you're in you know, uh, some of the, the middle income countries, there's a little bit more room to have safety net programs. Um, but in a lot of the poorest countries, the margin is, is non-existent. And so there, um, many of these countries were already hit by higher food and fuel prices last year. Uh, in some of them, the food prices did not come down as much as they did uh, in the developed world. And then on top of that, if you have a lot of people losing their jobs, you no longer have the income for food. So it's not just a price issue, it's an income issue. So where we're most concerned are some of the countries that have been struggling heroically to climb their way back up, uh, the Liberias of the world. Um, you know, I just was in uh, Navongo in Uganda and Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Each one of those uh, is either coming out of conflict in the near term or did so in the past 10 or 15 years. And there the challenge is also can they maintain the regional economic integration they need to be economies that will draw investment, maybe from the U.S. and Europe, maybe from China. So 
what we've been trying to do is support them not only through some of the uh, funds we have called IDA for the poorest countries where we use grants or long-term interest loans, but also try to be innovative with other tools. Um, trade liquidity. Some of them, for example, couldn't get trade finance even where they could export, so we put together a program to deal with that. Uh, infrastructure development. Infrastructure, as we saw in China in the late 90s, can create jobs, but also create the basis for future productivity and growth. Microfinance, very important for a lot of uh, smaller uh, and poor players, um, but a lot of microfinance institutions depend on cross-border funding, not on deposits like, like regular banks do. So we put together a special revolving fund for that. Um, we also want to try to address issues of distressed debt in the private sector, because one of the challenges, whether it be developed or developing world, is how do you make the move from a stimulus type of growth to getting the private sector back and fully engaged, and that's true for the developing world as well. Um, and critically, uh, the trading system, um, trying to hold off the forces of protectionism uh, because, of course, one of the key distinguishing characteristics of a recession that became a depression in the 1930s was a, a retreat to protectionism and to isolationism. So we've got to try to keep markets open, um, and in doing so, hope that a recovery can then help pull these countries back out of their difficulties. Well, it's interesting, at some of these, for example, G20 meetings that I attended uh, at the summit or at a ministerial level, the first response from a number of the developing countries was that the developed countries have to get their act together. In other words, the best thing you can do is get the U.S. and Europe and Japan growing again. And that was in part monetary policies, stabilizing the financial system, and in many countries, a stimulus program. People can debate the timing of the stimulus, how effective it was, but that was the initial phase. And I think what one saw uh, later in, in uh, 2009 was the fact that you had a, an overall, um, in a sense, broken the fall of financial markets. Then the question becomes, what is the basis for recovery uh, and growth? And that is an issue of, of keeping trading markets open, uh, encouraging the private sector to continue to grow, and recognizing that what is different in this period than the one 10 or 20 years ago is we're going to be dependent on multiple poles of growth. Um, in the 97 financial crisis, people looked to China simply to hold the currency peg, to stop further breakdowns of currencies. Um, the interventions and support for the International Monetary Fund and some of its added resources prevented that type of currency breakdown uh, so far in this crisis. But then the question would be, um, can in this time, will you look as China and India to be sources of demand? And one of the other opportunities, and this is an area where we're trying to help at the World Bank, is if you look at the recovery, most people were forecasting a, a slower growth path. Um, if you get demand from the developing countries, you could actually boost that growth, but they need the financing. And over the medium and long term, if you look at the changing international economic system, you would be better off if you have additional poles of growth, not only China and India and the U.S. and Europe, but Southeast Asia, over time Africa. And to do that, you have to invest in productive capacity. You have to have the infrastructure. Uh, you have to have the governance rules. You have to develop the uh, equity investments in the private market. And that's part of the agenda we need to have for Africa and other developing countries. Well, I think the, the call for reform is actually uh, predated the financial crisis, and there's a desire to modernize the multilateral institutions, which were you know, created after World War II to fit the whole different set of international circumstances. So while we've been trying to boost up our, our financial response, so for example, in our fiscal year that ended in the summer of uh, 09, we had about $59 billion worth of business, a big increase over the past, and that was private sector, the poorest, some of the middle-income countries, and the outlook for the next fiscal year is also going to be very, very strong. There's a continued demand. But what we also need to do is uh, reform the uh, legitimacy of the institutions through the participation of the developing countries, seats on the boards, voting shares, uh, other aspects that give them a sense that uh, they are full stakeholders in these institutions. Um, some of that, of course, depends on the 186 shareholders we have, but we're trying to nudge them in the right direction. 
within our control, we can do it through our appointments. So the first chief economist of the World Bank from a developing country is Justin Lin from China. Uh, we've appointed most of the new officers are from uh, the developing world. So this is a way of kind of building that capability. Now, there are other aspects of reform. Uh, governance and anti-corruption are key to development. And so there's a whole series of things we need to do on the preventive side, but also to make sure that we go after and sanction people that do something wrong and stop doing business with them and work with national authorities to take law enforcement action where we can. Uh, transparency. Uh, we've tried to, through our own internal processes and other actions, to open up the institution more. Uh, our contacts with civil society groups. Um, our work with the uh, regional development banks and the UN agencies. Uh, I tend to look at the international system as a network of players. So how does the World Bank, which deals with developed and developing countries of different size, uh, try to interconnect across a range of issues? We're involved with climate change. We're involved with post-conflict countries, Afghanistan, Liberia, Haiti. Um, how do we work well uh, with other players in the system? So uh, in that sense, you know, what this deals with is everything from financial resources to human resources to procedures to a transformation of an institution that's mission is not only finance, but how we take the knowledge and learning from around the world and be able to customize it for new circumstances and new continents. Well, I'm always reluctant to take on sort of one point. Sure. Um, but I, I think um, it is in the nature of capitalism to have booms and busts. But I think one of the lessons that the central banks are, have learned from this crisis is that you have a responsibility to deal with asset price inflation as well as goods inflation. Now, it's easier to say that than to do it. And that then goes to a series of questions about supervisory rules, bank regulation, issues of, of capital, of leverage, of making sure, um, as uh, the head of the Bank of England said, that a financial institution can go down without bringing down the whole system. So he suggested each institution, in effect, have a living will so that you could be able to unwind it without bringing down the system. Um, I guess if I would summarize it in one point, I'd say something that I've felt throughout my career, which is that you have to understand the basics of economic theory, but you also have to connect it to human psychology and institutions. And uh, if the theory tells you one thing, but the institutions won't allow you to, for example, have the market clear, well then the theory doesn't give you good enough guidance. And if the theory tells you one thing, but human behavior and psychology may work in another direction, you have to factor that into your overall model. And I think what the system is doing now is recognizing that you do have a global economy. These pieces are interconnected. They can grow up together or they can pull each other down. So you have to try to have the international cooperation while respecting national sovereignties so as to get uh, the best uh, value and cooperation and good from the system. And you have to avoid the downside risks. Well. Uh, it, the example actually kind of highlights the challenge. Um, special envoys can have different purposes. Sometimes historically special envoys have been used to convey a message. Uh, sometimes they're to bring back information. Um, if they are to have an operating role, so it's not just a communication role, but to try to solve problems, the real challenge is twofold. One, uh, the trust and confidence that they can develop in the parties. And second, their own connection to their own institution and government so they can get things done. So uh, I was really not a special envoy uh, when I worked with, with Darfur in Sudan. I was the deputy secretary uh, of state. Or when I did German unification, I was an undersecretary of state. And that highlights the issue, is, is that uh, through those posts, I had the advantage of being in a position where I could operationalize things through my own government, so therefore I could help carry out what uh, I was trying to, the ideas or, or solutions I was trying to come up with. I had the disadvantage that I had a line portfolio and a lot of different responsibilities. So I think in general, if the, the very nature of a special envoy is that um, you have to, however you do it, uh, make sure that the parties go beyond their talking points, they go beyond what they say publicly. Uh, you try to build a sense that 
uh, people want to address a problem, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they may figure it's in their interest just to stonewall or hold off. But if you get that sense, then you have to be able to start to exchange ideas, uh, probe, try different things. Um, but your ability to do that with another country depends fundamentally on whether they think that you can carry uh, whatever you're suggesting back in your own country, or better yet, with a group of countries. And that takes you back to the institutional position. Now, the special envoys that the Obama administration has, and Senator Mitchell and Dick Holbrook in particular, you know, are people who I think by nature of their personality and their reputation are pretty well connected into the system, so they should be able to have the follow through. Um, but anytime you use an envoy, it will raise a challenge of, well, for example, in the case of the Middle East, uh, whatever one is doing on the Middle East peace process, how is it connected with the economic development issues, the security issues? And I suspect that's partly the role that the National Security Council will play in this administration. Well, um, look, I think uh, in particular if we're taking this from a U.S. perspective, uh, individuals in the United States have an incredible opportunity uh, to uh, serve not only their own country but others around the world because the United States is an extremely powerful country in terms of economy and security and also its ability to shape political thinking. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that uh, in understanding and being able to use that effectively, you need first uh, some appreciation and understanding of other history and cultures and people. Um, and what I found uh, fortuitously was because I always enjoyed history, having read a lot of history, it put me in a position where I could learn more about the context of some of the issues. So if you're talking about a country like China, one has to recognize the feelings that China had going back to the unequal treaties of 100 years before, or the sense that uh, China feared about being broken up. And each country has its own challenges uh, that, that you have to uh, have reflected. But a second element is you're not going to be too effective in international affairs unless you understand your own country because you have to come back and implement things uh, within uh, your own political system, whether it be the Congress or, or uh, with your executive branch or with state and local governments. And so being able to bridge the two, to have a sense of your own political system but other history and cultures, and to try to come up with uh, constructive ideas to uh, advance uh, a larger goal or mission is an extraordinary challenge, but also uh, an extraordinarily uh, uh, interesting and intriguing task. So it stretches and broadens people over time. So in that sense, um, I think that uh, you know, of this era, part of the challenge will be how does the United States use this influence in a way that builds cooperative structures, just as people did after World War II with the global trading system, the multilateral development banks, and security system, uh, to be able to broaden the group of those that are stakeholders in the international system, and, uh, and that together one can learn to listen to them and hear some of their ideas and build a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts.